A bizarre and brutal crime. The woman's legs were actually completely burnt off. They had these huge holes and their bowels were hanging out. Can Dr. G complete an autopsy in time to catch a killer? And bring solace to a tormented family waiting for answers. I told him I love you and he said I love you too. And that's the last time I ever spoke. And then a man is found dead on a crowded Orlando bus but no one sees him die. He's in full rigor, poster lividity. The first question, was it murder or something else? The fact that he's found in a public place always raises your suspicions. Altered lives, baffling medical mysteries, shocking revelations. These are the everyday cases of Dr. G, medical examiner. While working in Texas during the summer of 2000, Dr. G was called on to help unravel one of the strangest and most disturbing cases of her career. In a span of 24 hours, she'd not only need to solve a heinous crime, but also help bring closure to a victim's shocked and tormented family. Sean Kane was born to a poor family in rural Texas, but he never seemed to let that get in his way. In school, he excelled at football, making All-American by his senior year. By 30, Sean was holding down two jobs and was supporting an ailing father and his five-year-old son for whom he shared custody. For those who knew him best, Sean's character was defined by his work ethic and his generosity. You know, sometimes somebody would come in the store and, you know, they would, you know, I don't have anything to eat. He would buy him something. He, I, I need a newspaper. Hey, here, you know. Everybody he ever saw, he helped, you know. He just, he, everyone. You know, I never saw him come across anyone in need or anyone that needed help that he turned him, tur would turn him away, never. But on a seemingly ordinary September day, Sean would be the one in need of help. He tells his family that he's going to watch a ball game at a friend's house, that he'll be back late. It is the last time his family will see him alive. That night, Sean doesn't return home. Instead, he ends up somewhere no one could have ever imagined. At 11 p.m. on a rural highway over 60 miles away from Sean's home, a rancher spots what appears to be a brush fire. But upon closer inspection, he makes a horrific discovery. And he looks closer and he notices there's two legs hanging out. What at first appeared to be a typical range fire is a pile of burning human bodies. He immediately backed off and called the sheriff's office. By the next morning, the fire is out. Police working with Dr. G's field investigator recover the remains of three bodies. But because all are burned beyond recognition, neither police nor the field investigator can even begin to identify the corpses. Faced with what appears to be a triple homicide, local police reach out for help to the state's premier investigative agency, the Texas Rangers, who handle nearly 200 murders every year. One of the primary responsibilities of the Texas Rangers is to assist other police agencies. On September 18, 2000, the Frio County Sheriff's Department contacted the Texas Ranger Office requesting assistance on a uh, triple homicide. Apparently, uh, witnesses had found three bodies. They were discarded on the side of a county road and were set ablaze. They were requesting our assistance on this investigation. Nearly 12 hours after their discoveries, authorities still have no idea who the bodies are. And though they strongly suspect murder, no one can say for sure how they died. The only one who can answer these questions is a medical examiner. 
I knew that I was going to be having three burnt uh, bodies coming in the morgue uh, because I'd heard about it on the news the night before. And so when I get there, we have our three burnt bodies, all of which are burnt beyond recognition. It smells like burnt barbecue, like you've like cooked something too long. With the bodies comes a team of Texas Rangers who quickly state their primary objective, identify the killers before they have time to dispose of any more incriminating evidence. For Dr. G, the clock is ticking. To do this, they assign one team, led by Ranger Marie Garcia, to observe the autopsy with Dr. G, while another team tracks down leads in the field. So everything we're finding, every little bit of thing that we know that's going on, we're telling Mari, and Mari's relaying it to Gary De Los Santos. The main thing that, you look, that you're look that you looking for, of course, you'd like to solve the crime just as absolutely as soon as possible. So the evidence that you collect, identifying these folks so that you can notify families. You know, people are seeing things on the news, Maybe they don't know the whereabouts of their loved ones, and, and this is the kind of stuff that we get done. Meanwhile, by 10 a.m., the Kane family is beginning to ask questions about Sean's whereabouts. He told my sister, you know what, okay, well, I'm going to go over to a friend's house, and uh, it, was, uh, it was early afternoon, and I'll be back in a few hours, and never came back. And he was missing for, you know, the first day he was gone, we never, we didn't think anything of it. We were like, you know, He's 32 years old, and it, it wasn't uncommon for him to go over to a friend's house and stay the night. At the morgue, Dr. G's staff is multitasking. Along with the bodies, the rangers have hauled in over 250 pounds of charred debris that must be scrutinized piece by piece. At the same time, Dr. G must perform three complex autopsies in order to discover the victim's identities and any clues leading to their killers. But first, she must try to answer the core question of any autopsy. What is the cause of death? In this case, the question itself is horrifying. First of all, you have to determine, are they alive when the fire occurred? Dr. G orders x-rays the first of many steps needed to determine whether the victims died an agonizing death engulfed in flames. Any charred bodies, it's charred beyond recognition, whether you think it's from foul play or accident, you're gonna do a complete x-ray of the body. The x-rays immediately reveal several critical pieces of evidence inside each of the three bodies. Bullets. We found both medium caliber projectiles, which appeared to be nine millimeters, and we found birdshot from a shotgun. But this discovery alone does not prove that gunfire killed the victims. Dr. G must also determine if the wounds they caused were fatal. To do so, she will need to perform internal autopsies. They're burnt to the point of being black and charred. Just finding wounds on a body that's charred down to sometimes internal organs are difficult. Difficult, but not impossible to Dr. G's trained eye. The first thing you do is just observe the body. Take a nice long look at the body. Start taking notes on the body. Start from the head and go to the, with the feet if they were there. Uh, and just go from head to toe, go from the back, look at everything. And then just start making notes of uh, what you're seeing. She begins with the male victim whose body was stacked in the center of the pile. Although heavily charred, Dr. G detects a defect, or hole, in the remaining muscle tissue on the man's back left shoulder. There's a huge gunshot wound. To the she immediately recognizes the abrasion as a shotgun wound. On his uh, posterior shoulder on the left side. But it didn't go into his chest cavity. It went downward. It shattered his shoulder. It shattered his scapula. Pellets were embedded in the joint of his arm, uh, into his bone, and, and just totally shattered the scapula, but mostly in the muscle. That in and of itself probably wasn't going to be a fatal wound to him. But what she finds next is a fatal wound. It looks like we have another bullet down here. Two bullet wounds in the man's abdomen. When I opened up the abdominal cavity, I could actually see the holes on the inside portion of the abdominal cavity, and I knew that those were gunshot wounds. And his two fatal wounds were the two gunshot wounds to the abdomen. Christian, do you have a fresh one? 
she moves quickly to the female body. With the woman, I found the gunshot wound to the back of the head, went through her brain, and then exited on near her neck on the opposite side. And so that definitely was a lethal wound. So she also had a, a shotgun wound basically on her uh, left side uh, near her breast. And this shotgun wound was really quite devastating, was a lethal wound. Dr. G now turns to the final body, that of the second male found at the bottom of the burning pile. So obviously he's got a lot of trauma. And on him, got, she oh, finds two got, shotgun wounds. He's got a large shotgun wound to his to the front of his uh, neck, and then a shotgun wound on the side of his neck here. It caused massive destruction of his neck. I mean, basically just his spinal cords transected. He's got like a two inch defect all the way going across his neck. Uh, it's certainly a lethal wound. I'm suspecting since we have a bullet in him that one of these is gonna be the e is an exit. And then we'll What's more, Dr. G finds that none of the victims have soot in their throat or lungs, indicating they weren't breathing at the time of the fire. Because the skin is all burnt, I can't really tell if that's an entrance or an exit. Based on her analysis of the gunshot wounds and the lack of soot in the lungs, Dr. G can now prove that all three victims were fatally shot before they were set on fire. Five hours into her investigation, she makes the official declaration. All three deaths are homicides. As the official ruling is radioed to the rangers in the field, Dr. G must answer a far more difficult question about the three victims. Who are they? One of the first concerns is being able to identify the body. Without identifying the body, you ain't going anywhere. Coming up next, Dr. G's team uncovers clues that may lead the way in a Texas manhunt. And the family of Sean Kane begins to worry. I had kind of a bad feeling. I thought, oh, you know, maybe he has a car accident, maybe he's in one of the hospitals. I never want to think your brother's dead. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. It's been 12 hours since three bodies were found engulfed in flames on a remote Texas field. Dr. G, now well into the autopsies, knows that all were shot to death before being set on fire. But neither she nor the Texas Rangers have any idea who perpetrated the horrendous act. And the three victims are still unidentified. With the odds of finding incriminating evidence diminishing by the hour, Dr. G is still in a race against time. It's noon, the day after Sean Kane drove off to his friend's house to watch the ball game. None of his family members have heard from him since. A call is made to the friend Sean was watching the game with. The friend tells the family that Sean left last night around 7 p.m. That's when we, my, my dad was like, hey, you know what, yeah, do something. At the same time, Dr. G begins her efforts to identify the female found in the burning pile. But it's not her body, but rather the victim's clothing that yields the investigation's first critical clue. Oh, this is interesting. Part of her bra was still intact, and under the bra was a ID card, it looked like a driver's license, had a person's name and a picture. Now, of course, I can't compare the picture. She's black and charred, I can't see, but we certainly had the name, so we thought, well, you know, we hit to gold here. Sure, could you go ahead and put this in an evidence envelope? The information is instantly radioed to the investigators in the field who rush to the address listed on the ID. To their surprise, they find the woman whose name is on the ID alive and well. But the lead is far from a dead end. The woman tells the Rangers that she had recently lent the ID to a friend, Marta Esposito, age 22. 
Still, the statement from Marta's friend is not enough for the investigative team. Next, the morgue staff locates the dentist of Marta Esposito, and comparing past dental records with those taken at the morgue, Dr. G makes a positive ID. With the identity of the first victim in hand, rangers continue searching for anyone who knew Marta to help shed light on her whereabouts the night before. One body identified, two to go. Back at the morgue, Dr. G turns her attention to the second body, the male found at the bottom of the burning pile. The man on the bottom, he would have been covered the most, so he would have had the le least amount of oxygen and burning around him. Uh, he still had a lot of normal Caucasian skin, particularly on his back, particularly on portions of his arms and legs, and there were numerous tattoos. Surprisingly, the Texas Rangers recognized the tattoos. They are the insignias of the deadly narcotics gang known as the Mexican Mafia. The Texas Rangers have seen their share of gang violence. Drug feuds between the Mexican Mafia and the prison-based gang known as Hermanda de Pistoleros Latinos, or HPL, have been raging for over a decade. And along with the gang-related insignias, the tattoos, spared by the raging fire, spelled out a name, Tomas Morales. The discovery is immediately radioed to rangers in the field. We know for a fact that a lot of the gang members like to uh, tattoo their names on their bodies, sometimes their girlfriends or wives. Fortunately for us, he did have his name tattooed on his shoulder, which uh, Dr. G was able to identify even though the body had been burnt. Tomas Morales is a name that Texas Rangers know well. He is a known member of the Mexican Mafia. By 4 p.m., Rangers are blanketing their network of gang informants, asking about Morales. Their relentless field work soon pays off. Several people tell them that Marta Esposito was Tomas's girlfriend and that both have been missing since the previous night. Two bodies identified, one to go. But before Dr. G attempts to ID the final body, her assistants alert her to evidence that has just been found in the pile of debris they have been sifting through. They had all this burnt material uh, that was with the bodies, partially covering the bodies, just partially thrown in on this huge fire, and they didn't know where to put it. They knew if they just sent it all to uh, a crime lab, the crime lab that they use, it would just take months and months to just sift through what just is ash and trash and what actually could be beneficial. One of the first things the assistants pull out of the charred pile is a piece of blue cloth. There was a piece of fabric that was a navy blue with some white specks, a, a kind of a strange design on it. It was very ugly. It almost had a snowflake pattern to it. It was blue and uh, very thick, and it had a heavy-duty zipper. It appeared to be aluminum. It was very shiny, very lightweight, and we never could figure out, you know, what in the world is this? Not knowing whether the fabric could be significant, rangers in the field are radioed the description. But then, Dr. G's team discovers a charred object that could break the case wide open. A couple of these pieces of carpet were burnt together, and I distinctly remember the fellow who were training to be a forensic pathologist, she's asking me if we do need to go through every piece, and I said, yes, every piece that needs to be opened and separated. And so we, I can remember her struggling with these two pieces of carpet that just kind of melded together, and she opened it, and here was this yellow piece of paper, partially burnt, Close examination reveals that it is a Western Union credit application. And she looked at it and said, is, is this important to you? And I looked at it, and it had a name and an address on it. And I thought, you know, what are the odds? Surely this couldn't be what I think it might be. I immediately got Ranger De Los Santos on the phone and asked him if this name and this address was of interest to him. 
Um, there was just silence for a moment. And he said, where did you get that? The address on the Western Union slip is the house of Paco Lopez, a known underboss of the HPL gang, the bloody rivals of the Mexican mafia. The Texas Rangers were excited because they realized, well, maybe this informant's telling the truth, and B, now we have a piece of evidence that we can go and get a search warrant and go into that house. Warrant in hand, the Rangers arrive at Lopez's house. As they burst in, three men make a run for it. We gotta run. Part of the search team gives chase, while others stay behind and begin to search the house, which immediately offers up damning clues. Then, when Ranger Garcia arrives, she notices something familiar. A couch covered in the same fabric that was found in the pile of debris at Dr. G's morgue. And I walked in, and the first thing I saw was a couch with this material on it. And lo and behold, there was a couch cushion missing. The other couch cushions had the aluminum zippers on it. So now we have two pieces of evidence tying those bodies to that residence. Lopez and the others in the house are now the ranger's lead suspects. By the end of the first day, two of the burned bodies have been identified, the scene of the shooting has been located, and the rangers have Paco Lopez, their chief suspect, on the run. This was an all-day process. In fact, we started um, about 8.30 in the morning and uh, spent eight hours on it. The speed with which Dr. G and her team unearthed their critical clues in the case is not lost on Ranger De Los Santos. Using her information to corroborate the information from the informant, that was very crucial in obtaining a search warrant and preventing the destruction of evidence at the house. If uh, we would have taken our time getting that information, uh, they could have eventually destroyed all the evidence and found nothing at the scene. However, there remains one final question Dr. G must answer. Who is the third victim still lying in her morgue? Coming up next, a surgical procedure performed three years earlier connects the dots between a horrible crime and a sister's desperate search for her missing brother. We started asking more questions, and, and it just that's when everything just kind of hit and sunk in. And later, a man dies on a city bus without any witnesses to his death. We really don't know anything about him. He's just, I mean, it was just kind of sad. With no known medical history, can Dr. G figure out what or who was this man's silent killer? When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. In the last 24 hours, Dr. G has performed three complex autopsies, producing a string of valuable evidence that has led Texas Rangers directly to drug dealers responsible for the shooting and burning of a woman and two men. But the third victim still lies in Dr. G's morgue, unidentified. Across town, Pam Kane the sister of missing 32-year-old Sean reaches out to a friend for help. My friend had a lot of people, uh, friends in the sheriff's department, and so I said, hey, you know, can you do me a favor? And maybe, maybe got picked up for whatever. You know, hey, just check it out. And they, so they checked all the jails, wasn't there, checked, I started calling hospitals, no luck. While the Kane family search turns up no leads, Dr. G examines the final victim. Unlike the other bodies, this one has no outward evidence to identify him, no ID, and no tattoos. However, when Dr. G reviews all her findings on the man, she discovers one vital clue inside the body. 
one fellow had had some major surgery uh, with orthopedic devices, metal rods going up the spine, probably for a curvature of the spine that was corrected. So we knew that that is not an everyday operation. The rods are known in medical circles as Harrington rods, a name borrowed from their inventor. And every rod has a serial number. Each of these rods are unique. All, all the orthopedic devices have unique numbers on them that we can track then to a lot what hospital they were sent to, and we can track down to the specific person that gets this. With the cooperation of the hospital, Dr. G secures the records, and with them comes a man's name, Sean Kane. The Texas Rangers are sent to break the news to the Kane family. Sister Pam, away at the time, has the terrible news delivered by her siblings. My other brother said, hey, you know what? We have to tell you something. And you know, my sister and I were like, what, you know? Well, the Texas Rangers have been here and they found Sean. And you know, we were like, well, where was he? Is he you know, at somebody's house? So, no, he's in the morgue. To double check Sean's identity, his family is asked whether Sean had undergone any back surgery. They confirm he had. Sean had broken his back. Uh, a few years prior, he, he had lived in Dallas for, for a time, and um, he broke his back, and he had two rods, I believe they're Harrington rods, in his back. The devastating news is only made worse by the strange and horrific circumstances. You know, the first thought that I had in my head when I found out all the details, you know, that they had burned the bodies, was please, God, let him have passed on before this happened, you know, so he didn't feel anything. Rangers quickly tell the family that Dr. G's autopsies revealed that her brother had died before the fire. It is a comforting answer to a grim prayer. But when Pam hears the circumstances of the death, an even more perplexing question is raised. I think my first thought was, what were you doing in that house? Could Sean Kane, hardworking father, supportive son, giving friend, have been involved with the Mexican mafia or their rival gang? Was he leading a double life? It is a question that will soon be answered with the help of Dr. G and the Texas Rangers. First, they discover that Marta, the female murder victim, and Sean were in fact loosely related through marriage. But a remote family tie explains precious little about that grim night. However, since the arrest of Paco Lopez and his accomplices, Texas Rangers have secured a key informant, the brother of Paco Lopez. Forced to help dispose of the bodies, Paco's brother came forward, afraid for his own life because of what he knows. To put his brother Paco away where he can't hurt him, he tells the Rangers everything he knows about the murders, including Sean's involvement in the incident. After a dramatic 48-hour tandem investigation in the morgue and in the field, Dr. G and the Rangers can now explain how all three bodies ended up burning by a remote Texas roadside. Sean leaves his friend's place after watching a game around 7 p.m. and is probably heading home. Sometime on the way, he picks up Marta Esposito, whom he knew through a family connection. She is accompanied by her boyfriend, a drug dealer from the Mexican mafia gang named Tomas Morales. Exactly where they met that night will never be known. What is known, according to the ranger's informant, is that at approximately 8 p.m., Sean's car with Marta, Tomas, and Sean inside pulls up to the home of Lopez, a member of the rival HPL gang. Tomas is not making a social call. Talking to the informant and other folks, it was determined that he had arrived at the suspect's house collecting on an old drug debt that one of the subjects owed him. But Lopez, expecting Tomas, has no intention of paying and sets an ambush. The only hitch, Tomas isn't alone. Unbeknownst to uh, the people inside the house, he also had two other people with him. 
we believed that they knew they could not get rid of one person and leave the other two to walk away and notify the police. So they were coaxing to come into the house. One of the gang members comes out to the car and invites Marta and Sean into the house. Once inside, Lopez and company unleash their deadly plan. Their primary target, Tomas Morales, is the first to be dispatched. According to the informant and Dr. G's findings, Lopez empties both barrels of a 12-gauge shotgun from a distance of three to four feet. So the one is going straight across the neck, and the other is going in a more downward direction uh, towards the axilla. So he definitely, both of those would have been fatal. Uh, he died from the two uh, shotgun wounds. Marta Esposito is next. From Dr. G's findings, it seems she was futilely attempting to shield herself. Her arm was kind of up and partially in the way. The shotgun wound went through her liver, caused a lot of internal damage. The shotgun was around four and a half, five feet away. Sean Kane, the man in the wrong place at the wrong time, is the last to die. Field and morgue findings suggest that in the chaos of the other shootings, Sean attempts to escape through a front window. But as he does, Lopez wields his shotgun towards Sean and fires. And the shotgun wound is in his shoulder. It was a non-fatal wound. It was of similar distance, about four feet away, scalloped edges, only had one or two stray uh, pellets. But the blast spins Sean around to face his assailant. Then, one of Lopez's accomplices fires two shots from a nine millimeter pistol. The bullets lacerate his abdomen, wounds that end Sean Kane's life. Lopez and his accomplices then scramble to rid the apartment of massive amounts of damning evidence. After they killed all three, they uh, decided to call other people to help them dispose of the bodies. One of which is Paco Lopez's brother, who would soon turn into the ranger's key informant. They in turn wrapped up the bodies on, in carpet and drove them out to the countryside and set them on fire. The grim tale gives Pam and her family one note of solace. Sean was not involved in a gang or drug dealing. He was simply giving a friend a ride. The third victim on this case was an Anglo male, Sean. We do not believe he was associated with any gang. It just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. All three killers were in custody within a week. Due to the cold-blooded and premeditated nature of the murders, the prosecution sought the death penalty for Lopez. Dr. G's testimony about how the killings were carried out and how the victims died weighed heavily on the jury. You know, when I first got into forensic pathology, I think I had a fear that I would be testifying against really bad people and they would be just a few feet away and things that I would say would put them in jail or give them the death penalty. And, and that did scare me a little bit. And then once I've done it many, many times, I realized that I'm just reporting what happened. Paco Lopez and one accomplice were sentenced to life in prison. A third accomplice received the death penalty. For the Texas Rangers, it is an ending that couldn't have been reached without the efforts of Dr. G. I mean, she puts her whole soul and heart into what she does. Dr. G is just an extreme professional, compassionate person, extremely important, not only to, to us, the Rangers, but to all law enforcement. As for Pam Kane, the senselessness of Sean's death will always be overshadowed by the way he lived. Her lasting memory of Sean is not his horrific death. It is instead a small incident that occurred the last time she saw him alive. She had run out of gas and her brother came to help. I gave him a hug and I said, thank you for coming for me. And he said, hey, I'd, I'd walk the fire for you, you know that.
when Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. We have a 55-year-old uh, man who is found dead on the city bus. What killed this man on an Orlando bus, and why didn't anyone notice that he was dying? We knew nothing about him. I had no cause of death whatsoever. More than 14 million people in the U.S. rely upon it every day, public transportation. And for more than 20 years, Larry Haggerty has been a rider. 55 and never married, Larry is a Vietnam veteran who spent most of his life in Orlando. According to those who know him best, he's gregarious, enjoys time spent with friends, and loves his job in the wardrobe department of a local theme park where he has worked for almost two decades. Larry was just the kind of guy that you just knew that you liked. His, his character, his ideals, his laughter, he was so funny, uh, just, just made you feel good to be around him. Larry, however, didn't like to be behind the wheel. Instead, every day he takes a 25-minute bus ride to and from work on the Lynx number 50 route, which loops from downtown through the local theme parks. It was uh, Larry's own personal chauffeur. I mean, it happened to be a little bit bigger than a limousine, but uh, he'd know the bus driver, and uh, the bus driver usually kept the same route, so he would know him. and. Uh, um, if it changed, Larry would introduce himself, and it wasn't didn't take long for anyone to know Larry. And uh, he, he he seemed to like that uh, the fact that he didn't have to worry about driving, he didn't have to worry about the insurance, he didn't have to worry about maintenance. He found comfort uh, in the fact that he could get on the bus and go home. Today, however, Larry isn't going to make it home. After getting off from work, Larry boards the bus at about 6 o'clock on a Saturday evening. He takes his usual seat, puts earphones on, and settles in for the short ride home. No one notices as he seems to drift off to sleep. Nearly 90 minutes later, the bus completes its route at Orlando's downtown bus station. All of the passengers disembark, except for one, Larry Haggerty. The driver tries to wake him, but he doesn't respond. He can't, Larry is dead. When I had uh, conversed with the driver about the situation, he was, uh very uh, stressed out or nervous, upset, because he, you know, once he realized the situation, you know, he just didn't know what to do. After Orlando police investigate the scene, Larry Haggerty's body is transferred to the morgue. There, Dr. G will be tasked with unraveling two mysteries, determining what exactly happened to this man on his commute home and why didn't his fellow commuters realize something was wrong? Twelve hours later, it's early Sunday morning. But while much of Orlando is waking up, Dr. G is working the weekend shift at District 9. So it's a Sunday morning, I'm in the morgue, and we have a case where the man is found on the bus the night before. My investigator goes and investigates, and uh, it's just a fellow we know nothing about. Normally, when a new body arrives at the morgue, Dr. G reviews medical records or personal histories of the victim that have been collected by her investigators before determining if an autopsy is necessary. 
But in the case of Larry Haggerty, tracking down information on the victim has been difficult. By 9 a.m., after a round of futile calls by investigators, Dr. G still only knows the basics about Larry Haggerty, his name, and the circumstances in which he was found. The, the fact that he's found in a public place always raises your suspicions a little bit more. So we would be more apt to autopsy him just because he is found in a public place, because bad things can happen to you in a public place. In cases where the decedent could be the victim of a crime, time is critical. Any evidence on the body must be collected as quickly as possible. With this in mind, Dr. G and her staff begin to prep Larry Haggerty for examination. When we return, Dr. G begins the autopsy on Larry Haggerty and must consider a dark possibility. Was he murdered? In a head, could have been trauma, maybe somebody bumped him on his head. I always have to be suspicious. On the commute home from work, Larry Haggerty dies on a crowded bus without anyone noticing. Nobody remembers him getting on, and nobody remembers him having any troubles. Now Dr. G must determine a cause of death and answer this question. What would cause a man to die unnoticed on a bus full of passengers? As Dr. G prepares to examine Larry Haggerty, she approaches the case with one thought in mind. There are an infinite number of ways to die. Often, clues to a person's mysterious death can be gleaned in their medical records, providing Dr. G at least a starting point for her investigation. But in cases like this, where there are no records available, Dr. G must approach her work as if it were essentially a blank slate. Anything could have caused this person's death. In this case, we had no clue. We had no clue that he had any history, and we didn't know anybody that knew him. However, there is one small yet crucial inference that Dr. G can make about the cause of this man's death. Whatever or whoever killed him must have done so quietly, so quietly that no one noticed a thing. And that is why, as she begins the external exam, Dr. G is on the lookout for any signs of trauma that might indicate foul play. What I definitely had to do, since he's found out on a bus, is make sure there's no trauma. So I look very carefully, from the head to toe, under the armpits, up between the legs, everywhere. No tattoos, no vascular scars, fingers are a little dirty. No anterior wrist scars, no chest scars, no surgical scars. A couple of bug bites on him, though. What if he gardens or something? Bug bites, but nothing else. Okay. There's no clue that there was any kind of trauma related. From the looks of Larry externally, foul play seems less likely. But a body holds many secrets on the inside. And in Larry's case, as soon as his chest is opened, it reveals one to Dr. G. Larry was a smoker. Big old lungs, kind of overinflated. He a big old barrel chest, too. A lot of blackening from his sm smoking days. But even though Larry's lungs are damaged from his smoking, Dr. G can see that they did not kill him. His heart is another story. To begin with, at 620 grams, it is nearly double the size of a normal heart. Oh, that's big. But that's not the only abnormality Dr. G finds. He's got very bad coronary artery disease. His entire left uh, anterior descending is calcified. The vessels that supply blood and oxygen to the heart, the coronary arteries, were severely narrowed. We don't even have very minimal opening. And it's, some of that's necrotic, too. Dr. G wonders whether Larry was aware of his deadly heart condition until she finds two foreign objects. It's got, ooh, he's got a stent in his coronary artery. Wish we'd have known that. The two stints Dr. G discovers in Larry's coronary arteries are wire mesh tubes inserted during angioplasty, a procedure where a balloon-tipped catheter is threaded up into the arteries of the heart. Once in place, 
the stints serve as buttresses to hold open previously blocked vessels. As soon as I saw those metal stents, I know that he'd been to a cardiologist and has a history. In addition, Dr. G finds several abnormalities in Larry's heart, a clear indication that Larry suffered several heart attacks. One of them likely occurred some time ago, but the other is much more recent, only hours old. In this case, the back of the heart had areas of recent uh, heart attack with uh, fresh, real early hemorrhage in there. So I knew there's a new episode going on over an old episode. But this discovery raises more questions than answers. Gripping, crushing pain is the hallmark of the overwhelming majority of heart attack victims. If a heart attack killed Larry, why were there no witnesses to this telltale sign while he rode the bus? Dr. G theorizes that Larry might have suffered another type of heart attack altogether. Classic heart attack is the chest pain. I'm having the big one, you know, Ethel, and you go down. And um, the, but there's about 20% with heart attacks that they don't feel anything or very minimal symptoms. It is known as a silent heart attack. A silent heart attack is exactly like a normal heart attack. In each, blood to the heart is cut off and part of the heart muscle dies, resulting in the formation of tough scar tissue, which weakens the heart and can trigger deadly arrhythmias. But there is one critical difference between the two. A person having a normal heart attack will know it. One having a silent attack will not. I don't know why. I don't think anybody really knows why. Some people have the classic symptoms and some people have atypical symptoms or no symptoms. After finishing dissection of Larry's heart, Dr. G now knows for certain how Larry Haggerty met his fate and why no one on the bus knew he was dying. According to Dr. G, Larry Haggerty suffers coronary artery disease as evidenced by the stints and severe blockages she finds in his heart. Then, while at work that Saturday, Larry unknowingly suffers a silent heart attack. A friend saw him sit down, and was a little out of breath, and uh, on asking about it, Larry said, oh, nothing's wrong, and got up. Later that evening, as he boards the bus, an area of Larry's heart is beginning to die from lack of oxygen. The electrical signal that generates the heart's beating can't get through the damaged tissue. The heart short circuits and stumbles into an arrhythmia. It was irritable, and so instead of beating, so all the rest of his brain and the body can get blood, it starts quivering. He can't pump blood to the brain, so he passes out. Within minutes, his heart ceases to beat and Larry stops breathing. To everyone around him, he appears to be just another sleeping commuter. Everybody gets off the bus and he's still sitting there and finally the bus driver gets to the end of the line and notices he's sitting in the back. When Dr. G later compares her findings with Larry's past medical records, she discovers that he had suffered a first silent heart attack a year earlier. In an amazing coincidence, she also learns that that attack took place on a bus where he was also discovered unconscious by the driver. Only on that occasion, he was still alive and medical help arrived quickly. This time, Larry was not so lucky. No, it just, to me, there was a sense of sadness to the case. Here's this man just minding his own business with his liver phones, probably trying to block out the world, sitting on the bus by himself, nobody notices anything. He's just, just sitting there and dies. It, there's just something a little sad about the, the case to me.